Hi, I'm Ken Dale, Executive Director with Prevention Network Michigan. Prevention Network has been around for about 30 years, working throughout the state of Michigan to help community groups prevent underage drinking, youthful tobacco use, and other substance abuse. Our main goal is to work with local community groups to address local issues with local solutions. We do convene a couple statewide groups like the Michigan Coalition to Reduce Underage Drinking and Parenting Awareness Michigan. But even those events, those activities, are really focused on helping you at the local level come up with local solutions with local problems. The Prevention Showcase is a chance for Prevention Network to work with the leaders from nonprofit groups and organizations here in the capital area and throughout the state of Michigan to tell their story. We want them to be able to showcase what it is that they do best right in your neighborhood. We hope that you enjoy the show. I just want to mention who I am. My name is uh, Ken Stecker. I'm the uh, Traffic Safety Resource Prosecuting Attorney. Um, and I'm um, with the Prosecuting Attorneys Association of Michigan and I'm funded uh, by the Office of Highway Safety Planning. Um, with the handouts, just to go through the handouts, prior to that, I'm sorry, prior to that I was a prosecutor for 18 years in uh, Branch County and also Kalamazoo County. I've tried every case imaginable, including many, many uh, drunk driving cases, minor possession cases, all kinds of cases dealing with underage drinking and, and, and it just, uh, that was really my docket for, for many years and uh, I really, when I was in Kalamazoo, I had the opportunity to uh, um, just do drunk driving cases for two years exclusively. That's all I did in Kalamazoo and uh, this was back in the uh, 90s. A lot has changed with uh, the, uh, the, OW, the operating while intoxicated law. We'll talk about that today. Um, when I first started in Kalamazoo, way back, I won't mention when, um, I may have had two drugged driving cases a year. That's it. Now prosecutors are getting five to ten drug driving cases a month. I mean, drug driving is very prevalent. We're going to talk about that. And uh, we'll talk about some other issues. Also, another big hot item right now with the legislature is dispensaries, medical marijuana dispensaries. Don't be surprised if you see dispensaries in our state, government regulated, within the next three to six months. Um, and so that's also a concern, certainly with uh, uh, underage uh, a use too is the uh, the marijuana and based on some of the information I'll show you today you'll see where I'm coming from with that particular issue. I just want to go through the handouts for a second to make sure everybody has the handouts. The one I'm going to focus on this morning is underage alcohol use top 10 questions. Um, you want or 10 questions not top 10 questions not like um, and then also you have uh, for this afternoon 10 questions about drugs and then you have a handout with that and then you have three different uh, PowerPoint uh, handouts. The one I'm going to work off this morning is called the Traffic Safety Legal Update Underage Drinking and we're going to work with that and then this afternoon we're going to start with designer drugs of the uh, present and also emerging drug threats, drugs that are coming into our state and we'll uh, cover that this afternoon. The other handout you have, uh, the other two handouts you have is you have a traffic safety training brochure that Office of Highway Safety Planning uh, did for us. These are uh, great. Uh, talks about the program, what I do, and also um, what a traffic uh, safety resource prosecutor is. There's currently 49 traffic safety resource prosecutors, um, or let me try that again, 49 states have traffic safety resource prosecutors. The only state that does not is Maine, for whatever reason they don't want to get on board. I can't explain why. Um, we also have the uh, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, the Northern Mariana Islands, which I applied for and was denied. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, and also the Puerto Rico position, but I was denied too for that. No, I'm just kidding. But I love what I do. And so if you ever have any uh, uh, questions about underage drinking, uh, the operating while intoxicated law, medical marijuana law, designer drugs, uh, I'm, the, I'm the person you want to contact because I, I stay up on top of all those issues. The one thing about underage drinking, I'll be honest with you, I had to familiarize myself again with this. Um, this was a, an issue that I didn't really stay on top of uh, thanks to uh, Diane. Um, I was able to really study about this, learn about this, and then put together this PowerPoint, which I think will be very beneficial and useful to you. The one thing I am definitely good at is the law. So if you have any questions dealing with the law, let me know as we go through this, because I, am, I, stayed, on, I stayed on top of that. Um, 
uh, in the last several uh, weeks with this particular issue. Um, I pride myself about the law, analyzing the law. My first job out of law school, I was a law clerk in Big Rapids, and I loved it, and I've never stopped just knowing the law, the details of the law, and understanding the future of where these laws are going to go. The other handout you have, I ordered 100 of these, um, abused pharmaceutical substances, um, because we are very much a drug society, unfortunately. And so you see some of the drugs in here. Uh, the one that's uh, very prevalent right now, we'll talk about this afternoon, in the top left-hand column, uh, the second column actually, is this drug called Soma. Soma's a, a pain reliever for the back. Um, a lot of teenagers love the Soma for whatever reason, so they'll take mom and dad's Soma, and then they'll unfortunately overdose on it or become sick on it. But you see some of the other drugs here that teenagers love, more specifically in the far left hand, two columns are the ones that you'll see quite a bit of with the teenagers. Uh, but these are the prevalent drugs right now, not only in Michigan, but also uh, nationwide. And we'll come back to that. Let's get started. At any time you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm going to call on Diane and Mike to help me out during this presentation. I've already forewarned them of that. Um, so they'll be uh, more than happy to do that, I'm sure, for me. First of all, anytime I give a presentation, I always dedicate it to my son. I have two funny stories to tell you from the weekend. He um, asked if I had a piece of paper, and I said, uh, Jacob, I don't have any paper. I do have an envelope, a blank envelope. He goes, well, I need to draw the American flag on it. And so he draws the American flag on it, but unfortunately, I don't have a red marker. And so he draws it blue and white. And he goes, Dad, I need you to go outside, because these six-year-olds order you around all the time now. I need you to go outside and get a twig. Um, so I go outside and I get a twig or a stick and he goes, well, is it long enough? And I go, yeah, it's long enough, just use it. And he puts the flag together and he goes with uh, duct tape and he says, follow me and he posts it in the stairway. And he's like, every time you go by it, you make sure you salute it. I'm like, okay, I will do that. So, and then he goes, dad, while I was getting ready, he goes, dad, I need to talk to you. It's very, very important. And I go, what's up? He goes, what are these? And he brings out all the Christmas toys he found in the closet. So now I have to come up with some lame story as to why they're in the closet. And uh, he's not supposed to have them until Christmas. Um, wow, it was just one of those days. He's quite the snoop. Uh, first of all, it is a growing problem. And this, I did a lot of research on the statistics, and I think it's important for you to note some of these statistics on the PowerPoint. Um, alcohol is the drug of choice among American adolescents. Uh, this is staggering. More 8th, 10th, and 12th graders drink alcohol than use tobacco or other drugs. That includes marijuana, the cocaine, uh, the soma, or whatever other drugs out there. And then in 2012, more than half of 12th graders about one-third of 10th graders and about an eighth of 8th graders reported having been drunk once in their life. So that's pretty, uh, that's not good when I, when I saw that. Uh, in 2012, approximately 9.3 million persons ages 12 to 20, 25 percent roughly of the age group reported drinking alcohol in the past month. Approximately 5.9 million underage youths were binge drinkers and 1.7 million were heavy drinkers. Now this is a question I need to ask you. What's the distinction between a binge drinker and a heavy drinker? Anybody want to help me here? And how much are we drinking? More than five. More than five, absolutely correct. What's a heavy drinker? Daily drinker, how much? Average. Six pack? Two. Pack. Actually, it's only two drinks. Yeah, it's only two. It's, uh, 14 drinks or more per week for a male, and I forget what it is for a female. Right. It's a little under for a female, about 12. But I think it's important to know the distinction between a binge drinker and a uh, heavy drinker. As she mentioned correctly, with a binge drinker, you're getting to that 0 .08, 0 .10 level. You're basically going out and having a shot, another shot, and another shot within a certain short period of time. Now, the thing to keep in mind with binge drinking is this is how it works. A six-ounce glass of wine is 0.02 in your system. A 12-ounce beer is 0.02 in your system. 
and one shot is 0.02 in your system. So if you have five shots, you're now at 0.10. Now it dissipates 0.015 every hour out of your body. And obviously it depends on your weight and it depends on certain other issues if you ate any food. But certainly this is important to know that, uh, how much 0.02 is with respect to what you drink. Um, and sometimes when I go out with friends who drink, they know what I do. So they're like telling me, hey, Ken, I had three glasses of wine in the last two hours. Am I okay to drive? And I'm like, I can't make that decision for you. You have to make that decision whether you're okay to drive. But, um, you know, you obviously got to, and, but my preference to you would be not to drive, or my thoughts to you would be not to drive. In 2012, 3.74 3, million persons younger than 21 used alcohol for the first time, of which 2.7 million were younger than 18 years of age. Uh, this is also um, something that concerns certainly those that deal with the traffic safety issue. 2011, approximately 1,230 people other than the driver, now this is other than the driver, died in car crashes involving 15 to 20 year old drivers with a blood alcohol content. Look at the blood alcohol content. That's 0 .01. That's like minuscule. That's nothing. You know, and then obviously, um, when you're at a 0 .01, I mean, that's like less than a, uh, a, 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 that's like a half a beer. So that's, that's amazing. Underage drinking costs US citizens $62 billion. And these costs include medical care, work loss, and pain and suffering associated with the multiple problems uh, with the alcohol consumption. I'll just give you a case that I just got a call on yesterday from Dickinson County. We have uh, two teenagers, um, I'm sorry, one teenager is driving. Two teenagers are, um, are in the vehicle. Uh, the teenager that's driving is at a .05. The other, and he gets into a crash. The other two are seriously injured. I mean, broken collarbones, broken bones, all kinds of injuries. The two teenagers do not want to testify against the other teenager. These are kind of some of the cases that we have. So now we have to find a way to get, because he's been charged with two, char two counts of operating while intoxicated, causing serious impairment of a bodily function. Now we have to find a way from a prosecutor's point of view to get this into evidence, their, in essence, their medical records. And then HIPAA issues come into play. But a lot of teenagers protect other teenagers when it comes to the drinking issue. That's the point that I'm making here. Uh, here's underage uh, adolescent, uh, adolescents drink less frequently than adults, but drink more per occasion. You can see, obviously, the drinking days per month for the uh, underage and then also for the adults 26 and older. Uh, certainly the days are less, I mean uh, more than half for the, uh, for the adults. But look at the usual number of drinks and the occasion. Uh, the drinks are more. So this is a, a very compelling slide. Um, I do believe without question the underage drinking laws, including the 21 years of age to drive, excuse me, to, to drink is working. Look at the number of uh, lives that have been saved. They didn't really start doing the statistics uh, per year until 2003, but you can see each year it has, uh, except, uh, yeah, each year it has gone up in terms of the number of lives saved. That's a good, that's a good thing. Uh, the implications of underage drinking, young people who begin drinking before age 15 are, more, are, are, four, more, are four times more likely to develop alcohol dependence and are two and a half times more likely to become abusers of alcohol than those who began drinking at age 21. And certainly that affects the brain, as we'll show in a second. This too, from the Office of Highway Sa Safety Planning. In Michigan during 2010, this is something I believe you really need to work on. This is the focus right here. Drivers under 21 were 43% more likely than older drivers to be involved in a drunk driving crash. Wow, that's pretty high. Um, and I think that's where the teenagers really are somewhat just hardened to this. They just don't see it. Um, but yet the crashes that I used to see where five, six teenagers are, are dead in a, in a motor vehicle crash, that's certainly um, something that uh, needs to be focused on. Uh, the impact on the brain, 
Uh, certainly frontal lobe development and the refinement of pathways and uh, connections continue until age 16. This is kind of interesting, not only for alcohol, but also for marijuana. Sanjay Gupta talked about this with the marijuana issue. And a high rate of energy is used as the brain matures until age 20. Damage from alcohol at this time can be long-term and irreversible. Everybody, not only with alcohol, but any type of drug, it's fascinating about Sanjay Gupta because he wants, he believes that we should now legalize marijuana and it's, it's all good, but everybody forgets that he also said that individuals should not be taking or using marijuana until they reach a certain age. That age is in the mid-20s. It's not 16, 17, 18 years of age. It's like, it's 25, 26 years of age. Short-term or moderate drinking impairs learning and memory far more in youth than adults. Adolescents need only drink half as much to suffer some negative effects. And I really like this uh, picture right here, um, the next one. Adoles uh, adolescent drinkers score worse than non-users on vocabulary. Their memory obviously is not there as much as those who don't drink. And certainly they're worse in school with their grades, also depression and some other issues that come into play such as social problems. This is a very fascinating image that one I've had for a long time. 15 year old uh, male non-drinker in terms of performing memory tests and then the 15 year old uh, male heavy drinker. Uh, who is drinking? This is, a, uh, not, this is obviously um, Julian on the side, percentage of uh, high school, Michigan high school students. These, uh, this is specifically Michigan, these graphs. It talks about alcohol and marijuana use. If you look over here with alcohol prior to age uh, 13, then obviously you look at the numbers here, the 24% for the ninth grade students, and then um, 17 for the uh, 10th grade, 17 for the 11th, and then 16 for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the 12th grade. This one's the big one right here, alcohol ever. Then you can see how high it is for the uh, the 12th grade students. Marijuana, you're seeing the increase with marijuana use. This is, uh, this is very concerning. I can't stress enough the marijuana use. Uh, prior to age 13, the numbers are low, some would say, but marijuana ever, you can see the numbers increase as the grades increase. This is very concerning. Uh, trends in drug use, um, who is drinking, ever drank alcohol? You can see that this has gone down year after year in terms of ever drank alcohol. Ever used marijuana, you can see from 2001 to 2009, that too has gone down. And then used marijuana recently, that somewhat has steadied from 2001 to 2009. Just, uh, there is a uh, small increase of uh, 3%. There was this small increase here but I would attribute, uh, and this is just me, you gotta keep in mind that Michigan adopted the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act um, in November of 2008. So I'll be curious to see what the numbers are in 2010, 2011, 2012 with marijuana use um, for, uh, for underage uh, uh, use. I, I can promise you this, and I'll buy everybody a lunch in here if I'm wrong, those numbers are going up. So. Um, we have about, and we'll talk about this later, about 100, you know, obviously under the age of 18 in Michigan, you can be on medical marijuana as long as you have two doctors sign off. Um, and I believe that number, even though it's only 100, I'm sure there's a lot of others that are involved with the uh, marijuana use. Um, what type of alcohol do current underage drinkers usually consume? Liquor seems to obviously take uh, front stage there. Male. Females, males, uh, the one that, uh, if you look at this one and you look at what males like and what females like. Males like the liquor more so than the females. The beer, males like the beer more than the females. The malt beverages, what's an example of a malt beverage? Anybody want to help me? Yes, is that? Ice. I, I would put that in liquor. But there, no, there's certain Smirnoff. Yeah, there is. You're right. You're right. You're, yeah, you're right. I'm, you're correct. Um, others that come into play for malt beverage? Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah, Mike's Hard Lemonade. Absolutely. Um, so obviously this one here, wine coolers, the wine, and others, and then no usual type. 
So obviously we have uh, distinctions with the type of uh, liquor that, and type of beer and malt beverages and wine coolers and wines that we like. What type of alcohol do current underage drinkers usually consume? Then obviously this is broken down by the grades. You can see the 9th, um, 10th, 11th, 12th. Seems as you get older, you like the liquor. And then beer, obviously the 10th graders, not as much. And then, but the 9th and 12th graders seem to, see, seem to be tied right there. Malt beverages, 9th grade for malt beverages, the highest percentage. Wine coolers, 10th grade. Wine, it seems to dissipate or, or just uh, slide off, so to speak, when you get to 12th grade. And then you see the others and then no usual type. The liquor is the big one. These are great, great slides. And this is where I'm going to ask for Diane's help, but what are they drinking? Alcohol energy drinks. So I drink this. I drink one of these every day. Amp. I haven't had this yet. Could you imagine if I had this, how excited and energetic I would be right now? But I'm going to wait till later. <laughs> so here's the amp. So is amp okay for me to drink without any liquor in it? The answer is yes. How about this Rockstar 21? And Diane will help me to make sure I'm right on these. Is that okay for a teenager to have? Anybody? How many think it's okay? Raise your hand. How many think it's not okay? Yeah, it's not okay right here. They don't make them anymore. They don't make, well, if they don't make them, then that's a good thing. Monster Energy, is that okay? Yep, Monster Energy is okay. It's similar to the amp. Um, how about the Sparks? No, no. Nope, Sparks no good. How about the Rockstar Energy drink? Just the regular Rockstar Energy drink. Yeah, that's okay. And then you see the Sparks, the Tilt, and the Charge. I'm gonna talk about two of these specifically in a minute. But obviously if I look at this can, there's no question that they tell me right on the front of the can, even though this is a non-alcohol energy drink, there's caffeine and vitamins, uh, Boost Original, and certainly no question it has a high caffeine amount, but these ones that do have alcohol, I have, it, I have a higher than normal alcohol content, more so than the beer. And then additional stimulants like ginseng, taurine, and uh, guarana, and it's marketed to look like non-alcoholic energy drinks. So, but here are some of the drinks. Um, this is what's concerning. The alcohol content varies from 6% to 12% per can. Um, if you look at the Budweiser, the Miller High Life, and the Corona, you can see the alcohol level uh, for those particular drinks are much lower than the, um, than the energy drinks. And obviously that's a, that's a concern because if you have more alcohol percent in that can, then obviously your BAC is going to get higher sooner than if you're drinking individual uh, beer, can, uh, beer out of cans. Uh, blackout in a can, um, this is the concern right here because this is like this doing this with each other. Depressants and stimulants going at each other, that's a very, um, that's a dangerous combination. High popularity among college students, law enforcement, yes law enforcement and certainly parents, um, emergency room professionals cite disbelief at the effects of these, uh, these products. Uh, here's Tilt. Tilt's an energy drink containing alcohol. It's marketed as premium malt beverage. Obviously the females like the malt beverage. Its active ingredients include caffeine, ginseng, and guarana. Its alcohol content by volume varies from 6.6 .6 in the berry flavor and up to 8% in the lemon line. So it depends on what kind you like higher than most American beers, and slightly higher than the competitor, Sparks. And then here's the Rockstar that I understand they're not making anymore, but when they did have it, it was around 7% alcohol. Alcohol energy drinks, this is the uh, four local that Diane was talking about. Uh, they can't be sold in Michigan, however, it's not illegal to have them in your possession. That's the one thing that's important to keep in mind. And then here's uh, an up-to-date list of products banned in Michigan. That's the website for those banned products. And the list is pretty extensive. Um, also, the Alcopops, 
Um, 51% of 17 to 18 year olds and 35% of uh, 14 to 16 year olds have tried Alcopops compared to less than 25% of adults. Um, this is the one that she mentioned, you know, the Mike's Hard Lemonade. Um, when asked what type of uh, alcoholic drink they would most prefer to drink, nearly a third of teens said alcohol, alcohol, alcohol pops, excuse me, I have a tough time with that too, compared to only 16% for beer and 16% for mixed drinks. Um, where are they drinking? Uh, here's where they're drinking, um, because obviously the uh, laws come into play with this. Another person's home, 54%. And my home, 32%. Riding or driving in a car, which is always a concern, 5%, and then other places, 8%. What those other places would be, I have no idea. Uh, how much are they drinking? Uh, any binge drinking reported in the past 30 days in Michigan? Uh, the percentage, obviously, for youths, um, over, it's, almost, it's 21%. In adults, it's 17%. And then uh, males. 24% uh, for the adults and 21% for the youth. But uh, the females, you can see the females with the binge drinking. This is the one that's almost doubled than the adults. Where are they getting it? This is something I think you also need to focus on. I got it some other way, 22%. Uh, person gave it to me, 22%. Gave money to someone to buy for me, 29%. That's the highest. And then you got concert or sporting event. That's pretty low. They, they do a good job at the concert and sporting events, quite frankly. Um, convenience stores, 7%. Restaurant, bar, or club, that should be a concern, 9%. And took from a store or family member, 11%. But right here, gave money to someone to buy for me, almost 30%. And that buy for me is usually, will that be somebody else who's a youth or will that be an adult? Yeah, it'll be an adult. Um, so that comes into play. Um, this is something that's uh, interesting. 20 years ago when I was involved in this with uh, prosecution, they got money together, just a few dollars. They bought the beer, limited means of transportation. If fight breaks out, they use their fists. Uh, intoxicated sex, sexually tra transmitted uh, diseases were, uh, were limited to, uh, to a, 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 a few. Today, each person may have 20 to 40 dollars alone. They buy a lot of alcohol. They buy the hard liquor, as the statistics showed you. Most kids have cars, so more uh, apt to drive. And if a fight breaks out, weapons are not far behind. And uh, date rape, the ecstasy drugs, the GHB drugs. And so this is the change in society and the minor possession issues. Um, old way, word separated at school or by landline telephone. I mean, how many of us have landline telephones? Uh, none. Anybody in the home? Okay. <laughs> Let me try it again. How many have landline telephones at home? Okay, well, I had one at my old home, but when I moved, I, I didn't get one. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very few. It's like 5 to 10%. Uh, easy to spot, spot false identifications, certainly. Um, everyone piles into one car. Today it's selling picture phones. It's the emails. It's the text messages. It's the computerized false identifications. And it's the blogs. And also it's the movies. It's, it's Hollywood too um, that, that does a lot. I mean, if you can think of any movie dealing with teenage and drinking, teenagers and drinking, I'm sure you can come up with one very quickly. Ten things I hate about you. There you go. Or, uh, or um, oh, what's the one that they went to Las Vegas? Um, Chevy Chase and uh, the family went to Las Vegas. Uh, yeah, yeah, that one. Um, what about a blog? Re reality TV for the web. Nearly 10 million teenagers blog. And teens put themselves at risk by revealing private information. And obviously, this is something Diane's certainly familiar with and does a lot of uh, training on. Common websites for teenage bloggers. These are only three that, I've, uh, that I came up with, LifeJournal, uh, Zanga, and MySpace. But then this is where Diane was very helpful with me uh, with some of the information she's provided me within the last uh, year, year and a half. This is what she uh, provided to me. How are they getting away with it? Look at all of this. I had no clue what some of this was until she obviously educated me. I mean, I know what Facebook is. 
I know what Instagram is now, but some of these other ones, I have really I have no clue. But look at them. I mean, this is just a this is just a thumbnail of the of the um, uh, the, uh, the the sites out there. In urban areas, they drink in plain sight. In rural areas, they drink off the grid, and they are also certainly posting online. This is something that Diane also provided to me. I thought this was fascinating. Can anybody translate this? Here's what it is. I was so jacked up last night, I scored some marijuana. They spelled it with a J, not an H, at the party. So I have it for tonight and tomorrow. And then Jimmy took off with it, the, you put whatever word you want in there. I'm all jittery and need to meet up with you tonight after my parents think I'm asleep. I had no clue what that meant. Let's talk about Michigan law, but before I talk about Michigan law, I need you to take out a piece of paper and write down what you know or come up with what you think are five underage drinking Michigan laws. Criminal or civil? Just five. I want to see what you come up with. The number one misdemeanor for underage drinkers, without a doubt, not even close. It's like that show Family Feud, you know, guess the number one, is minor in possession, without a doubt. The law criminalizes any bodily alcohol content. Now, here's where I think the law is kind of weird. And it talks about, the law talks about purchasing, consumption, and possessing. But I never got this from the legislature because it says .02 or any presence of alcohol within the body. So that could be .01. Sure. I never got that. They should have just put any presence of alcohol within the body. But I'm not the legislature. I don't make these laws. It's a misdemeanor. It's an increased punishment for second offense, 30 days in jail, $200, community service and or uh, rehabilitation. Third offense is pretty serious, 60 days in jail, $500 fine. There is community service. This is what it's all about right here, the license. SOS is to suspend the license for a second offense, 90 days. Sorry about no parentheses here. That's my fault. Or third offense, 365 days. Now, the one thing with minor possessions, when I dealt with minor possessions by the truckload as a prosecutor, we allowed the, basically the plea to be taken under advisement for six months or one year, um, as long as they didn't get in any trouble or have any difficulty for a first offense. For second offenses and third offenses, we never did that. But I used to have parents come to me all the time saying, my son's on the football team, my son's a 3.8 student. I mean, I had, I had this all the time. Some, some parents were a little more friendlier than other parents. <laughs> other parents wanted to act as the defense attorney and be in the room with their 18, or with their, uh, with their 18 year old, and I certainly did not uh, allow that. So there's a lot of protection too by the parents, rightfully so, I get that. But also there's the responsibility aspect uh, of the child. Uh, this is something that's interesting. I still get a lot of calls on this from uh, magistrates and prosecutors and, and some others. Back in uh, 2007, this is a very important case called Platt versus Thomas Township. The federal district court ruled that the portion of the MIP statute compelling a PBT, that's a preliminary breath test, upon a finding of reasonable cause constituted an unreasonable search without a warrant. Therefore, you have to go get that warrant if you have probable cause to believe that they were drinking and you want to basically have them take a PBT. Now, this is a case from the city of Troy, People versus Child Harry. They had their own city ordinance, similar to the state statute. The city attorney called me. He called me in 2008 when I first started my job as a traffic safety resource prosecutor. And he said, Ken, we're thinking we just lost in the circuit court on this issue. We're going to appeal the case to the Court of Appeals. I suggested to them, do not appeal the case. You will lose. They said, we're going to do it anyways. And guess what? They lost because there was already a case out there from the federal district court that basically will knock that case out of the water. 
So this applies to city ordinances that have this type of language and also uh, the state statute. The state statute is this one right here. This is in essence void, no good, where it gives police officers may not rely on any authority granted to them pursuant to that particular statute. That's a statute where you can compel a PBT without a search warrant in essence. So you can't do that. Um, this is also important to a 19 or 20 year old person who lawfully consumes alcohol in Canada cannot be convicted with the unlawful consumption of alcohol in Michigan. This is actually a case out of not this, can, not this part of Canada, but this case, there was a case from the, uh, the Sioux where somebody came across uh, into Michigan after drinking in Canada up in the Sault Ste. Marie in Canada and then came into Sault Ste. Marie in Michigan. This is kind of interesting though. Yeah. Can you just mention too that law enforcement officers can write a minor possession ticket without the results of a PBT? Absolutely. They just have to document. I mean, teens, they're not good drunks. It's pretty easy to, uh, you know, to justify why you're giving them a minor. You know, they're slurring their speech, they smell like alcohol. And, and it's good to see Diane, at least um, it's always great to see that Diane's listening to me because she's right on. And here's what she's talking about. Obviously the portion of the PPT statute in any PPT ordinance is unconstitutional now. You gotta get that search warrant. But here, as, as, uh, as Diane mentioned, here's what officers should do. They should seek consent. Under Michigan law, consent to search permits a search and seizure when the consent is unequivocal, specific, and freely and intelligently given. Now that's certainly a concern with a minor uh, to meet those, those elements. But here's other things as she, Diane was mentioning. What is in their hands? How do their eyes look? In the horizontal gaze nystagmus. Um, how do they, what do they smell like? How do they speak? How do they act? And are there beer bottles around that person? and what evidence is it, evidence that the minor had been drinking. So this is where she's going with that, and this is what they have to do, and this is what we're asking law enforcement officers to do. Uh, possessing or transporting alcohol in a motor vehicle by a minor, this, yes? So if they, and I, from what I understood too, if they say that they won't take the breath test, they can still arrest them, right, and then take a blood test? As long as they get that search warrant. They gotta get the search warrant for the, or have consent. And generally, I wouldn't play with the consent issue. I would just get the search warrant to get the blood. Now, I can tell you this. I got a call from the Lake County prosecutor. Lake County's like where? Baldwin? Baldwin's the, the, the county seat of Lake, uh, of Lake County. And he, he calls me and he says, Ken, what's this people versus child hairy case? And I go, well, Mike, that's a great question. I go, why are you asking? He goes, well, a number of underage drinkers were just... Um, stopped and basically asked if they were drinking, would they take a PBT, and they knew the child hairy case. I'm like, the underage drinkers knew the child hairy case. <laughs> so they know the cases. They know the law too. Huh. And, um, and I had the prosecutor call me asking me, well, what's the child hairy case? <laughs> so I'm like, you need to know that prosecutor. So I obviously educated him on it. Um, so possessing or transporting alcohol in a motor vehicle by a minor, this was one of them. Person who knowingly transports or possesses alcohol in a, minor, a motor vehicle. This is important here. It does not matter whether the alcohol is opened or capped. Doesn't matter. That's very important. Charges apply equally to the drivers and the passengers. That's also important. And this is a, a, a misdemeanor offense. 90 days in jail. If it's 90 days in jail, as Diane pointed out, they can do an appearance ticket you don't have to take fingerprints. You only have to take fingerprints if it's 93 days or more. So, and a $500 fine, community service, SOS to suspend license, 90 days, within seven years or, or of uh, the first, first offense to the second offense, or the third offense is uh, 365 days. False ID to purchase alcohol. A minor, this was one that was also mentioned by you, Minor who uses fraudulent identification to purchase alcohol liquor is guilty, guilty of a misdemeanor, 93 days. So that means fingerprints on the minor, because it's 93 days. And also an officer who witnesses this violation may stop and detain a person to obtain satisfactory identification. 90 day suspension for the SOS, even though there's not a driving issue here. That's always surprising, I'd be that guy that said he's in trouble, hadn't driven, he was just- Right, they got the 90 days. A false ID to another 
to purchase alcohol, which is similar to the other one, but it's to another. It is also um, a 93-day misdemeanor. <coughs> and once again, the SOS suspends your license for 90 days. So, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yeah. No, now's so the time to ask. It goes in and um, uses a fake ID. The store owner or the clerk cannot hold them, right? But they can keep the ID. Correct. So then if the if the student leaves, how do you follow through to make sure that they get the consequences as a store clerk? Or Anybody want to help me with that? I'll throw it to you guys first. Yeah. I guess if the store clerk can hold the ID, that that is evidence that you can use to... But it's fake, so it may okay. not be their actual name, their address, things like that, to be able to contact them. Sure, that, that's that's a difficult situation. Yeah, you, you, we have had I've had store owners ask me before when I do retail visits, and I'm like, I need to get educated. Well, the o the only other thing you too, the other thing too is you have the camera. Hopefully, they have a camera inside too. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, and so obviously they can get the uh, the image off the camera. Um, cameras are always fun. Um, for evidence purposes, but um, yeah, that's a difficult situation, especially if it's a fake ID. So you have to look for other alternatives. And that's the one I would always come with the camera. Okay. Not all stores have cameras, but most stores now are getting cameras. So, um, consuming alcohol on unlicensed premises. Um, this was also mentioned. You shall not maintain a premise not licensed under the Liquor Control Act and allow other persons to consume alcohol for consideration. Now, this is weird. Because this is a felony, and most felonies are one year plus one day. All felonies are, in essence, except maybe two that I know of, this is one of them, where it's a felony and it's one year in jail. If it's one year in jail, it's a misdemeanor for everything else. Like if you um, commit domestic violence, second offense, it's a one year misdemeanor. Uh, retail sh uh, fraud, shoplifting, second offense, it's a one year misdemeanor. This is bizarre because it's a felony, but yet you go to jail. If you commit a felony, the, 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 the incarceration time's prison, not jail, for felonies. Yeah? Ronnie can explain that. It was written in 1933. Was it? Okay. Well, that's the reason then. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out why this is a felony for a one-year misdemeanor. Why? It was written in Yeah, so, um, and also consideration. This is kind of a, a broad definition. It means any fee, cover charge, sale of food, ice, mixers, glassware, or other containers, or even the storage of alcoholic liquor. Consuming alcohol on school property. This one's a, um, one that goes somewhat under the radar. A lot of us don't know about this particular law, but the, you can't consume alcoholic liquor or possess with the intent to consume alcoholic liquor on school property. School is defined in the law as a public school of kindergarten through 12th grade. And here's the definition of school property, which is pretty broad. Um, I like this definition because it talks about buildings, playing fields, vehicles, or other property used for functions and events sponsored by a school. Does not include a building primarily used for adult education or college extension courses. This is a first offense, second offense, and third offense. So the third offense is a one year um, it gets obviously the 93 days uh, from the first offense to the second offense stays the same, but the fines increase. But this is one I think you, you obviously need to know and remind others of. Uh, consuming alcohol on a highway, this too was mentioned by you. Um, alcoholic liquor shall not be consumed on the public highways. This is a 90 day misdemeanor, so appearance tickets are allowed for 90 day misdemeanors. Don't have to fingerprint them and arrest them. Um, also, you don't need to be in the vehicle to be charged with this offense. I mean, you know, walking along the highway or, 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 or whatever, you don't have to actually be in the vehicle. A uh, minor with a BAC, zero tolerance. This was one of the first one men mentioned. This law has not been around that long. I would say a little over about 10 to 15 years. It's a .02 to a .08. Um, but this is the part that uh, I recommend to prosecutors. Apparently, the one prosecutor didn't see my recommendation because he didn't follow bullet number two here. If the person's bodily alcohol content is 0.08 or higher, it is recommended to pursue operating while intoxicated charges. You don't have to confine yourself to the zero tolerance charge for that minor. And so obviously, that helps for purposes of enhancement um, and, and so forth. Now, this too, I get a lot of calls on by prosecutors. 
Punishment may be enhanced if subject has a prior alcohol-related driving offense. This is called the enhancement. Operating while intoxicated first offense, operating while intoxicated second offense, or operating while intoxicated third offense as an adult. However, you can only use one zero tolerance conviction for a felony drunk driving enhancement. So if I want to charge somebody with that one to five year felony as an adult, and he has, a pri he has two prior zero tolerance convictions, I can only use one of them. So now I can't charge him with a third, I can only charge him with a second offense, the one year. Um, operating minor with any BAC, occupant less than 16 years of age, a person obviously 0 .0 to 0 .08 again, less than 21 years of age, cannot have anybody in their vehicle less than 16 years of age, they're guilty of a misdemeanor. This one's a little more severe, vehicle immobilization or vehicle forfeiture may be ordered by the court. Not a lot of courts order that though, I can tell you that right now. They don't order uh, the seizure of the vehicle. The license is 180 days suspension. Uh, you can be eligible for a restricted license and also you have to pay the cost of prosecution and reimbursement fees. So cost of prosecution, we're starting to see more of that too. Um, social gathering. I was involved with the social gathering legislation several years ago because somebody in Branch County served minors, the adult, at their home and two people left the minors and were killed. That really upset me. And there was no law in place until about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. I don't remember the exact date. This other thing bothers me about this law, and I gotta, gotta be careful what I say, but it's only a 30-day misdemeanor. I, I don't get that. And then uh, second offense is a 90-day misdemeanor, why? But I can't legislate, and I won't legislate. But I did, when the law did pass back then, before I became in my present position, I asked why? 30 days, really? Um, and this is how it works. You're an owner, tenant, or person in control of the premises, residence, or other real property, and you have to knowingly allow a minor to consume or possess an alcoholic beverage and or a controlled substance. I get a lot of calls from prosecutors on this and officers. They ask me, well, does it only include alcoholic beverages? And I go, no, it includes controlled substances too. So that's something to know that you need to keep in mind, especially in today's world. Um, it must involve two or more individuals not of the same household or immediate family. Um, what's the one exemption that you can think of where you're allowed to drink if you're under the age of 21? Church. Church, religious exemptions. That's the only one that comes to mind for me, okay? Religious exemptions. Other states are a little more liberal than our state, but that's the one. If you can think of another one, I'd like to know, but that's the one that's certainly mentioned in the OWI statute and also mentioned in the uh, couple other uh, areas. Um, furnishing the minors. A uh, person who normally sells or furnishes alcoholic liquor to a minor or fails to make diligent inquir inquiries to the person is, uh, is a minor, they're guilty of a misdemeanor. Um, retail establishments are different uh, from the penalties against individuals. Obviously, they're a little more lenient, so to speak. The statute also applies to minors who furnishes alcohol to other minors. This is something to keep in mind. I get calls on that too. Um, other minors can be charged for furnishing to other minors. Um, also, um, here, the, the commission, if they receive alcohol from a retail establishment, uh, the commission or local law enforcement uh, obviously can go after those employees and they're responsible. But as somebody mentioned, it's only a state civil infraction and a civil fine of $100, okay? Um, furnishing to minors causing death, um, not a retail, who's not a retail licensing clerk, agent, or employee, and who normally, which I don't, who, whatever, who normally sells or furnishes alcohol, makes diligent to inquiry. They're looking at a, a pretty severe felony, pretty strict felony, and if subsequent consumption of the alcohol liquor by the minor is a direct and substantial cause of that person's death, that causes that, uh, that, that person's death. This is what's called proximate cause or there's no intervening cause that caused that death. Um, let's talk about some other ones that not necessarily um, 
only just apply to minors, but also apply to adults. But certainly a minor can be charged for any one of these, depending on the circumstances. These mostly are for adults, but every now and then minors do get charged for this. The big one here is operating while intoxicated. In Michigan, I have to change this. Um, I, I, I meant to change it yesterday. We now have three different categories for operating while intoxicated in Michigan. We have liquor, we have controlled substances, and we now have intoxicating substances as of March 31st, 2013. Here's why we made the distinction, or I'm sorry, why we made the change, not the distinction. Controlled substances prior to March 31st, 2013 only included Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 drugs that you were operating on at the time. Well, there are a lot of drugs that fall outside of Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So those drugs are called intoxicating substances. And now that category has really filled the gap or filled that hole that was previously not filled prior to March 31st, 2013. It also includes substances that are intoxicating substances such as dust off. Dust off's the computer spray. People like to take dust off, all right? We're starting to see, Diane was just in our, one of our A-Ride classes, and I think we had six officers raise their hand in the class that said, yeah, I just had a dust off driving case. We also have other cases involving, uh, um, and dust off, do kids like to take stuff off their nose? Sure they do. Axe hairspray, why not? Raid, lemon pledge, whatever they can take up their nose, those are intoxicating substances, and you shouldn't be driving on them. Now this one here is the lesser included offense to this one, um, operating while visibly impaired. In Michigan, we have a scheduled one operating while into intoxicated law. This is how it works in Michigan. This also applies certainly to uh, underage, uh, 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 to, uh, to teenagers and underage youth. In Michigan, we're one of 16 states that has a what's called a zero tolerance law for operating if you have a Schedule One drug in your system. Schedule One drugs include ecstasy, heroin, GHB, bath salts, K2, spice. Those are all Schedule One drugs. Another Schedule One drug in Michigan and under federal law is marijuana. We spell it with an H, by the way, in Michigan, not a J. I did spell it correctly there. We're one of four sp states that spells it with an H. Marijuana is a scheduled one drug. If it's a scheduled one drug, it means it has no medicinal value or purpose, and it's not recognized, in essence, as doing uh, a proper, properly treating you as a medication. Now, marijuana is a fascinating issue, and you'll want to note this, and I'll talk about it a little later. There's a case you'll want to write down called People versus Coon, K-O-O-N. Mr. Coon is in Grand Traverse County. Mr. Coon is driving. I don't know why I do this, but he's driving. And as he's driving, he's a medical marijuana patient. He has a card. He's stopped by the sheriff's department. Mr. Kuhn says, I have my medical marijuana card. Do you know the medical marijuana law, officer? And the officer says, I do know the medical marijuana law, but I also know the OUID per se law, which is operating under the influence of drugs per se. Zero tolerance. Basically, you have a Schedule One drug in your system, Mr. Kuhn, and I only need to show two elements, that you're driving and that you have a Schedule One drug in your system in order for me to arrest you. Mr. Kuhn says, no, no, no. The medical marijuana law says you have to show an additional element. You have to show I'm under the influence of the marijuana at the time I'm driving. So there seems to be a conflict with those two laws. One says you have to show you're under the influence. The other one says it's just zero tolerance per se. The case goes all the way to the Michigan Supreme Court. The Michigan Supreme Court looks at language in the Medical Marijuana Act, Section 7E, that says any act Inconsistent with our act, our act trumps your act. So in essence, the Michigan Supreme Court says, hey, the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act trumps the OUID per se law. 
So the point I'm making here is we now have two different standards in Michigan for driving, whether you're underage or an adult on marijuana or THC. If you're a medical marijuana patient at the time you're driving, the prosecutor needs to throw, show three elements. You're driving, you have that THC in your system, and you're under the influence. On the second example is, if you're not a medical marijuana patient and you're driving, the prosecutor needs to only show two elements. You're driving and you have that THC in your system. I'll give you an example. We have a case in Van Buren County. Young lady, 21 years of, 22 years of age. She drives through a stop sign. She kills four women. She has one nanogram of THC in her system, which is a small amount, but she does not, she's not a medical marijuana patient. She does not have a car. So the prosecutor needs to show these elements. I'm driving, or she's driving, she has THC in her system, and she killed somebody. If she was a medical marijuana patient, you would have to show four elements. She's driving, she has THC in her system. At the time she's driving, she's under the influence. And she killed somebody. That's the distinction with this law now, with marijuana and driving. It's a very important case, this People versus Coup, um, that came down earlier this year. All right, so please keep that in mind when you see, when, they, when you hear people talk about marijuana and driving. This is a OWI causing death. Um, that's a 15 year offense, operating while intoxicated. Um, or operating while visibly impaired or operating under the influence of a drug. <coughs> operating while <coughs> intoxicated, causing serious impairment of a bodily function, which you mentioned, your example, that's a, that's a five year felony in Michigan. And then the last one is operating uh, child endangerment. Basically, you're driving as an adult, you have somebody 16 years or less in your vehicle, that's a one year misdemeanor. Medical amnesty to minors. May 8th, 2012, signed by Governor Snyder into law. Here are the three main components of amnesty, and this is one Diane pointed out. A minor who consumes alcohol and who voluntarily presents himself or herself to a health facility or agency for treatment or for observation cannot get a ticket for minor in possession. All right? That's this medical amnesty law. Where does this come into play? How, what, what are some examples where you can see medical amnesty coming into play? Yeah. Alcohol poisoning. Alcohol poisoning. Suspecting. <clears throat> exactly. And here is what alcohol poisoning is. I just looked it up. It's confusion, stupor, vomiting, seizures, slow breathing, less than eight breaths a minute, irregular, uh, irregular breathing, blue tinged skin or pale skin, low body temperature, hypothermia, and unconsciousness, passing out. Alcohol poisoning, absolutely. And then a minor who initiates contact with a peace officer uh, or emergency medical services personnel for the purpose of attaining medical assistance for a legitimate health care concern. But certainly the prosecutor, as Diane mentioned, can look at the entire circumstances and look at other options if there's something else out there for that minor in terms of what he or she did. Um, I'm going to talk about this, and then I think we're, well, I'm almost done here. Uh, keg tag registration, this took effect. Governor Granholm signed this into law back in December of 2010. Uh, this is a fascinating law. Does anybody know or see this law in play being used? Well, it requires retailers selling beer in a keg to attach an identification tag to the keg, requires the purchaser to sign the receipt, and obviously refuse to return the keg deposit if the tag is not attached when the keg is returned. Has anybody seen this at all? Hmm. The, this is who gives the ID tags out, right here. Yeah. It requires the liquor control to make ID tags available to retailers selling beers in a keg. The individual signing the receipt does so with the understanding that he or she does not damage the keg or remove or alter the attached tag. And they sign the receipt, uh, does so with the understanding that he or she is subject to liability for serving the beer to any minor. That's important. Retailers' responsibilities. They must keep a copy of the receipt for at least 30 days after the uh, date the keg is returned and make the copy available for inspection to the Liquor Control Commission and law enforcement agencies. 
Um, the fine is very small, 50 bucks. If they fail to apply an ID tag on a keg, intentionally fail to complete the receipt, or fail to obtain the purchaser's signature on the receipt, um, they're only 50 bucks. So maybe it's a cost effective thing, maybe not to put the tags on there, I don't know. Um, not a retailer wholesaler, this is basically the one that gets the keg. They can be guilty of a misdemeanor, 93 days, for removing an ID tag from a uh, keg containing beer, not a bag, allowing the removal of an ID tag from a keg of beer purchased by that individual, and providing false information in the purchase of the, uh, of the uh, keg. It's interesting that nobody has seen this. You have to ask yourself these three questions. What can you, or I'm sorry, what can we do as a community? What can we do in our schools? And what can we do in our homes? Those are three very important questions. This is what we don't want underage drinkers to turn out to be like. <laughs> Does everybody know who that is? Nick yeah, that's Nick Nolte. And then he, had, he was asked to pick a number between 12 and 14. He picked 18. He was asked to, uh, he took a breath test, 0.26. He was pretty hammered. And this is certainly what we're trying to prevent right here. 18-year-old driving, crosses the, uh, on US 23, he crosses the median at over 90 miles an hour, has himself and three other teenagers in the vehicle, four people in his vehicle, hits this vehicle head on. Two people in this vehicle in their 60s both die. They're married over 40 years. So you have two deaths there, the 18-year-old driver dies, and two of his friends die. So we have four people that die, or five, I'm sorry, five people that die. One survives, he doesn't remember anything about the crash. All this guy had in his system, it wasn't alcohol, his BAC was .000. All he had in his system was THC, marijuana. So I get really bothered when I hear that, well, if you have THC in your system, it's not as bad as if you were drinking alcohol and driving. This is an example of where that, obviously, what can happen with just THC in your system, five people. Um, we can make a difference. We can save the lives of our children. And I do want to thank Diane. Diane gave me a, quite a bit of information on this. I appreciate it very much. And that's how you get a hold of me. Obviously, I'll be back this afternoon. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> and um, that's how you can get a hold of me. And that's, I want to thank also my association for allowing me the opportunity to do this. That's all I have. I want to thank you, and I'll see everybody this afternoon. Thanks.